Bob. I'm just going to get that presentation started. So let's start with how do you feel? How do you feel today? So if you want to just scan that scan that QR code or go to menti.com and enter the code 16107227. Amazing. I'm seeing you land there. Great job. All right. Fantastic. Oh, why does it say it reached the end of the present? Oh, because my, my slides are in the wrong order. <laughs> it's, it's a long day. All right. So tell me how you feel right now. How do you feel right now? For some of you, it's early. For some of you, it's late. For some of you, it's midday. How do you feel right now? <laughs> Botanical. <laughs> I've never felt botanical in my life, but that is amazing, amazing. I feel like I know who might be botanical, and that's just wonderful. <laughs> Some are feeling overwhelmed. Guys, don't judge me. That was a very intrigued. vulnerable second. <laughs> <laughs> overwhelmed, intrigued, anxious, pensive, curious. All right, excellent. My team, if you could just watch the watch the waiting room and just let people in as they come as they land there in the waiting room. Okay, fantastic, fantastic. So this is always a very interesting exercise to see what we've got in the room. All emotions are welcome, no judgment whatsoever. I'm seeing some hopefulness, intrigue, curious. Okay, excellent. So we are gathered here together uh, to discuss the ROI of customer experience and fielding some of those questions from your CFO or your exco. And I want to send you away today with very, very practical ideas that I've been using for the last 15 years to influence, to convince, and to get people to make budget available for CX initiatives, right? Okay, but before we get there, I want to just get a better understanding of where you find yourself. All right, get a better understanding of where you find yourself. So is your CFO or executive asking about ROI all the time? Just select a yes or a no. Yes or a no. Okay, good. Good. Now, what you're going to do if they're not asking, you're still going to follow the recipe that I give you today, right? <laughs> because that might just stop them from asking. Okay, excellent. Excellent. Oh, we've got a good yes, no, yes, yes. All right. All right. So I want to move on to the next question. Why is he asking about ROI? Okay. Why is he asking about ROI? Let's get some feedback from you. Where's the drum roll sound effect when you need it, Chantal? Ba boom and we've got noise cancelling headphones so that's not going to be helpful that i knock on my desk right okay all right asking because there's revenue or sales pressure they might feel it's not a priority they want to confirm the value right and anything in between those there's a ton of assumptions that you can make about why they are challenging you all right. In my early days, I thought they thought I'm not confident, competent and confident enough to run these large programs. I thought did suffer a little bit from imposter syndrome and probably had a lot of fears around my own delivery capability. So it just took someone to intimidate me with questions about numbers. And then I would go on a whole uh, down a whole rabbit hole of just doubts in myself. All right, so they want to secure growth and deliver results. Amazing. 
So I'm going to ask you, what do you think causes pain for your CFO? If you had to now put yourselves in his, his or her shoes, I've, I've only ever had, as I was preparing for this, I've only ever had male CFOs and I was writing these questions <laughs> based on the, the gender of my CFOs in my career, but it could be, what causes your CFO pain? Changing, changing market, declining sales, declining revenue. Budget overspend, revenue leakage. Now I can tell you just from looking at these words, that's one job that I don't want, right? It's, it's quite a challenging, it's really, really a challenging role. Unbudgeted requirements, low adoption of products. Yes, how many times are men are money spent and you know it doesn't quite deliver on the stated initial benefits? All right, fantastic, fantastic. Thank you for that insight. So I want to share with you a few um, a few insights, a few um, a few very practical tips on how to look at this and really how to reframe what you are doing in terms of your communication strategy and the information that you share. So I'm gonna quickly just switch, let's see if I can switch cameras and just bring up a few notes that I've, that I've prepared for you. All right, fantastic. So let me just reposition myself to get to the, the presentation that I prepared for you. All right, so I want to first of all, just share with you that for so long, I made some assumptions around people asking me about the ROI of CX. And I reported to accountants and actuaries for most of my professional career. And I would go, oh, not again, not again. I have to answer this question again about ROI. I have to spend six months building some kind of a model. And then someone said to me, Chantal, he's just doing his job, answer him invest the time in preparing an answer for someone who really wants to do well at his job. So just answer the people that are asking you these questions about ROI. And a lot of the time, I think so much fear in organizations are preventing us from tackling some of these, some of these um, more tougher questions. So first of all, what I did in the mentee is I, I, I asked you to put yourselves in their shoes. And this is a really, really great technique that I recommend for everyone, whether you are struggling with this topic or whether you are having other challenges, I really recommend that you do more empathy mapping. So carefully listening and doing empathy mapping for your stakeholders will lead you to a different end result through really thought through communication. So in this empathy map, you wanna look at goals, needs, challenges, and fears. Now, what I don't recommend is that you go to your CFO or your, your CEO and say to them, oh, please tell me about your fears. Just lie down on my couch and, and tell me about your fears. You probably don't wanna tackle it like that. But what I do for most of the important role players that I work with, I have a page in my notebook that has an empathy map. And every time I speak to them, I do clue scanning. Sometimes they'll tell me about things that I haven't heard the previous time and I will collect that and I will make sure that I compile this complete empathy map. Now it sounds a little bit like CF CSI uh, investigators and building up a profile on, on someone, but that's, that's exactly what I'm doing is I'm trying to get to look at life from their perspective, and that's really going to help me communicate. I think we're all here to make each other successful, but sometimes we get so focused on our own KPIs and our own needs that we forget that. So if my role is to make the CEO or the CFO successful, I need to understand, you know, what are their goals, what are their needs, what are their challenges, and what are their fears? And I want to prevent any of these fears 
and any personal risk entering into the pro projects that I'm tackling. Because there's personal risk for someone that approves a project budget and I don't spend that project budget carefully, there's a, there's a risk for them. All right, so once I've done my empathy map, it's important to understand um, the ROI, sorry, my dog's scratching at the door. It's important to understand the ROI of not only the CX initiative that I'm tackling, but the ROI of relationships. So what I'm essentially doing with my CX initiative is I'm trying to work on a, a, a deeper relationship with my customer. And there's a couple of things that I can do with that relationship. I can increase the length of the relationship. I can increase the depth of the relationship and I can increase the breadth of the relationship. And this is a really interesting little model model to use. So if I look at a typical scorecard for uh, CX, um, there's, a, there's a great thing about, you know, looking at this marble jar of clients in and clients out, right? I want to see how many clients did I gain, how many clients did I lose? I also want to look at share of wallet, right? How much of the typical spend a client has available are they spending with me versus with my competitors or in my category? Then I want to look at lifetime. So how long can I keep my customer? And, and the actuaries uh, refer to a term called lifetime value, which you can which you can calculate. And then I also want to look at repurchase behavior. So if I know how many clients am I winning, how many clients am I losing, how much share of wallet do I have, how long do they stay with me, and how often do they repurchase, then I can start looking at if I do X, can I see some of these needles moving? So you can look at NPS, you can look at effort score, and there's all kinds of metrics that you can look at, the, at trying to determine the, the quality of the, of the relationship. But in terms of business, business metrics, you know, these are the things that you really want to look at, even if they're supported by an NPS or an effort score. That'll tell you whether your CX initiatives are um, having a result on what the customer really experiences with your brand. All right, now we want to, when, we, when we're trying to um, prove a business case, we either need to make more money or we need to save more money. Okay, that's the only way you can go. There's nothing in between that. So if we want to make more money, we want clients to buy more, we want them to stay longer and we want them to tell their friends so that their friends will come and buy more and stay longer. If we want to save money, we need to look at the cost of serving, getting that down. We need to also look at, you know, acquisition costs. So how much does it cost me to acquire a new client um, through my marketing efforts? Right. And then if we look at cost of serving, there's probably an argument to be made for what a complaining client costs you, right? If something breaks, and the damage that a complaint can do your brand in terms of what it costs to handle the complaint and also the consequences of the risk to your brand in, in those complaints. All right, so that gives you a very high level overview of some of the things that you would like to look at when you look at the business case. Now, the very first business case I built for CX was working with a bunch of actuaries. It took us about six months to put together a model that linked lifetime value with NPS. And we looked at, you know, what can we do in terms of the loyalty drivers to start changing the relationship with clients and what would that impact then be on NPS and, and subsequently on, on lifetime value. So you can get very smart about this. I'm suggesting there's much more pragmatic ways to look at, at this business case. All right, now I want to share with you few more things. All right. So aside from these models, you also need some skills. It's not just about showing people uh, spreadsheets and PowerPoints, right? It's really about taking them on a journey and telling a captivating story. So one of the first skills I think that really, really helped me is storytelling. So aside from telling people, this is what I want to do 
this is why I want to do it and this is what I need. I learned quite early in my career, I can remember working on a specific project and I had a beautiful PowerPoint pack. It was probably about 40 slides because that's what we used to take to the boardroom those days, right? So I, I told this amazing presenter I had like an hour and I didn't get through all the slides and my point that I wanted to make was in slide 40. All right, now when you don't get through your slides, what do you think happens? Like people don't follow your storyline and you never get to the freaking point. And I can remember I walked out out of this meeting room and I had a I had a mentor at that time. He was a short Italian guy. His name was Nino. And Nino called me aside. He said, Chantal, that was fucking terrible. <laughs> and I said, but Nino, I worked so hard. He said, it was terrible. He said, Chantal, take your slides, reverse the order. We waited a month. He put me on the agenda again. I reversed the order of my slides, exact same slides. They said it was fabulous. I could have the money for the project. They gave me their blessing. Okay, content wise, I changed nothing. I just changed the order of the slides. So sometimes we build up to a crescendo versus we need to start with what am I looking for from you and why should you listen to me? So. I want to just give you a, a, a quick tip. Follow Dan Rome. If you are not currently following Dan Rome, follow Dan Rome on LinkedIn. He is just one fabulous human being. And he wrote a book called The Pop Up Pitch. Now, he teaches the pop up pitch and he's got this amazing template. I do all my presentations using his template. I do it within 10 slides and people mostly listen to me. And people ask me to go back to slides and they ask questions and it, it's really changed my presentation style. Just a lot, a lot more engaging. All right, then I want to talk to you just about visual thinking skills. All right, you see my presentations are hand drawn. I do that because I really care about you and I want to give you a personalized experience. I also do that because it helps me with the quality of my thinking. The last thing I want to do, you're giving me your time. And at the moment, you don't quite know exactly how much time you've got. So it's a precious resource. And I need to make sure that I don't talk nonsense when I talk to you. So I use the visuals to help me with my thinking so that I get my storyline straight. I also use it because it's very different, right? You could have arrived at this webinar. You could have just had death by PowerPoint, some really stock images of people that eat lettuce and have beautiful makeup, right? But I would rather give you visuals that you can uh, remember. So visual thinking is a great, great, great skill to use. Then the last piece we're going to get to, and I'm going to ask my colleague Ruthie to help me here because I want her to show you, and we have time Ruthie, I want her to show you a model that's probably going to transform your way of thinking. We call it the drama triangle. And the drama triangle is a great, great interpersonal model to use to understand yourself and to understand the people that you're presenting to. So sometimes we sit in meetings and I would use this drama triangle to peg where people are and to also look at my own reaction to people. So Ruthie, are you ready? You're going to share the drama triangle with us? Okay, I'm so, excellent. I'm ready. Thank you, Chantel. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. Uh -huh. All right, fantastic. Can you guys see my screen on the drama triangle? We Thumbs can. Up? Yeah, we can. Perfect. Yes. So as Chantel has just mentioned, the drama triangle is a tool which we use to identify conflict in an organization. And uh, usually as an individual, we have our default system uh, that we default to whenever we're in a conflict or we don't understand something. And the reason why we teach this model is we want you to stop the drama while you're working as a CX professional and do the work that you meant to do. So there are usually three roles and I'm going to start with the first one, which is my default system, but I'm working towards becoming a creator. So it's the victim. So anytime you find yourself telling yourself, oh my gosh, poor me, I don't know who's going to help me, save me, save me. We're going to dive right into it, but I just want to highlight the three roles. We have the victim where you feel like you're powerless, and then we have the 
prosecutor or the villain. This is, you know, the person who punishes other people, the person who blames other people. And then we have the rescuer. The rescuer is those people who just love to find problems and solve problems for people on their behalf. And yeah, so I'm just going to start with the victim. And uh, my favorite character all time is Spider-Man. So, you know, <laughs> the reason why we identify or let me start with the victim first so that you can understand uh, the hero better. So the hero, as you can see in the first light is someone who's poor, like you're always like, I can't do the CX initiative. They don't want to support me. Oh, poor me, I need help. I need somebody to save me because I'm helpless. I don't have what it takes. So anytime you find yourself uh, whereby you're, you're just feeling in that powerless, poor mentality, you're acting like a victim. But now what we want you to do is to think as a creator, somebody who is empowered to be able to solve their own challenges. Like you don't feel like it's because of the economy that I can't do this CX initiative, or it's because of my boss or the financial situation or the market that I cannot perform this CX initiative. But in that problem that you're uh, facing, how can I be a creator? How can I own up to my experiences and create something beautiful, as you can see. Uh, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to just let me know. And I'm just going to go to the next one. And that the next one is the hero to a coach. So I love Man City as well. You know, they're topping the lead. I don't know if anyone is supporting Manchester, sorry. <laughs> but uh, a hero is, let's say, a Spider-Man. For all those people who have watched Spider-Man, never have you ever seen Spider-Man teaching those people how to save themselves. It's always like, there's a problem. I'm Spider-Man. My job is to come and save people. I don't empower people to save themselves, but I come in and, you know, rescue the world, get all the glory. So in an organization, when you find yourself that you're the one who's always like looking for problems to solve for people in an organization, when something goes wrong, you're the first one to jump in. You don't want people to learn how to do it by themselves, but you take in the problem, do it by yourself. And I see this predominantly for people who are perfectionist in an organization. So if you're a CX person and you don't like the way things are done, so instead of like empowering people, you're acting like Spider-Man, you just go over, take over the work and you do it yourself. And what we realize is heroes are kind of like the most lonely people because people will always say, ah, Chantel got this. Of course, Chantel will come to the rescue. We don't need to do the work. Chantel will do it perfectly. After all, there's a way she wants things to be done. So as a CX professional, for you to be able to just take on the world, you just need to learn how to be a coach, how to um, to see people as people who can be empowered to do that particular job. So for instance, if you, you want your presentation done in a certain way and people keep messing it up, so instead of saying, you know what, I'll just do it by myself. So you just empower people to use this particular font, use this particular format, send them YouTube videos to watch. Uh, yeah, so if you're leading a team and you find yourself, you're having, you're struggling with delegation, you may be struggling with that hero mentality because you don't want, you don't see other people as people who are empowered to do it, you know, as you do it. So, yeah, so we just want to encourage you to, to just think like a coach, a football coach. I use this analogy. So can you imagine if this coach, uh, the coach of Man, Man City decides to say, you know what? you players are not playing the way I want it. You guys are doing a very bad job. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to be the goal. I'm going to be the striker. I'm going to be the defender. I'm going to be the goalkeeper. I'm, I'm basically going to be that particular person because you people are not doing your job. There won't be any <laughs> interesting football match. So that's why you see the coach is just there to tell them, you know what, you, you're, you need to do this. You need to do this. And this is how you do it. And these are the tools you need. I need to help you with your mindset. I need to help you with this and this. So, yeah. So anytime you just look at your calendar and you just feel like you don't have a moment to breathe because people are just loading things onto you. Maybe you could just kind of like examine, am, am I struggling from a hero mentality? And maybe is there 
that way I can coach people to be able to do what I do and even better. And the last one. I don't know how many of you have watched Joker. Maybe is it a, like a like a generation Z thing? <laughs> yeah. So a villain is usually that person in an organization who blames people, blames themselves, blames the economy, blames the organization, blames like anytime they're the king. I call them the king of blame game. Like if you want to know <laughs> what's going on in an organization, that's person is uh, the king of blame game. So anytime as a CX professional, you're in an interesting situation and you find yourself, you're blaming everybody, but you're, you're blaming literally, you're just on that blame game roller coaster. Just remember, you're just like that villain, the bad guy, the bad cop. And uh, the drama triangle just encourages you to be a challenger because um, maybe I can just say, you could employ strategies like recognizing what went wrong. For instance, you know, this product flopped in the market and we anticipated it. So maybe how can we solve it instead of saying it is a marketing fault, they didn't do a good job in marketing, you know, it's the finance team, they didn't finance this project. Maybe how can we like analyze that particular situation? What are the metrics we can uh, implement to prevent it from happening again? And then, you know, put in necessary pressure because whenever you like blame people in an organization and you're the person in authority. So people will always view you as that particular bad person. And maybe let me say, uh, when you're looking at the drama triangle, let me just go back to the first slide. We usually rotate in that drama triangle. Yes, we have a default system whereby in a situation you feel powerless and then all of a sudden you start blaming others. For instance, let's say, oh my gosh, I don't know why this CX initiative is not working or maybe the market is bad. And then you can shift from a victim to a uh, prosecutor. No, it's not my fault. It's actually that particular marketing department. They didn't do a great job. And then, then you say, okay, no, you know, uh, let me just try and do it myself because people are not doing it better. So it's a, it's kind of like a roller coaster, and it takes that awareness. Okay, you know what, Truthy, I'm acting like a hero. So, uh, what do I need to do to to get uh, to become a coach? And the reason why this is important, whenever you learn this, it just builds your awareness. Whenever you find yourself, I'm blaming somebody. I'm like, you know what, Truthy, you're acting like a villain. You're acting like the bad cop. How can we make this situation a little bit? better. I don't know, maybe Marile, maybe something to add, Marile? Oh, Ruthie, you are on fire, right? <laughs> oh, amazing, yeah. amazing, amazing. So, so I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna just pull us back to, you know, this, this topic of our CX uh, uh, return on investment, right? And, 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 and proving return on investment. So typically, we want to cast our CFO or our exco in this role of the persecutor or the villain, right? They're the bad guys, we're the hero, we're the rescuer, and we want money so we can make the bad guys more money, right? So, so this is a great, a great tool. I even go to meetings and I would plot where people are. And sometimes we make every every good story needs a bad guy, right? And sometimes we make our exco and our CFO, we might actually make them make them worse than what they are. Um, and if they ask those questions, we think the question is about us, but the question is really about them. So Ruthie, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for sharing this model with us. It's like been it's been so amazing listening to you. How do you feel, everyone? Pretty cool, hey? All right. So I want to share just a few more things with you. And then we will open up for questions. So let me quickly get back to the presentation. Okay, so the drama triangle is really, really interesting, interesting to use. I'm going to give you a quick recipe on how to communicate so that you get the job done. All right, so when we are doing that presentation, and I've given you, uh, thank you, Tess, I see the link there to Dan Rome's uh, work in the um, in the in the chat but i want to really simplify it because 
there's pretty much three things that you need to think about. So if you are pitching to your C-suite, your exco, your CEO, your CFO, what do you want them to do when you're having a conversation with them? What is the goal of that conversation? Is the goal of the conversation, hey, I would like you to approve this budget? Or hey, I would like your approval of, I'm going to spend X and this is what I think uh, the value is of this project? Or is it informational? I think it's very important to be clear about what do you want from your meeting? What do you want from the conversation? And start with that. Then you need to think about what do they want to know? All right, what do they want to know? And make sure that you go through a list of all the possible questions they might ask so that you can go in prepared and not leave any questions unanswered. Now, if you've done your empathy map really well, you're also going to have aspects on that empathy map that's going to give you a much more empathetic way to present your information. All right, so what does your CFO want to know? He wants to know the bottom line of most of my empathy maps said he wants to know that the information that you're presenting is accurate and that you're not going to make him look like a fool when you come and present back the results, right? He wants to be seen as smart. He wants to be seen as an authority in his particular craft and he wants to be seen as someone who's wise and who makes wise decisions for the organization. All right, so he wants to know that you have thought these things through, that you've done your homework and that what you're presenting to him is solid. All right, now what does he need to know? And I'm using he, he just interchangeably here. So what does your CFO need to know? Some of what he needs to know is probably not on his wants list, but usually we go in with that 40, 40, 40 page slide pack and we tell him what we think he needs to know instead of focusing on what he wants to know. All right, now I've highlighted it, these three aspects here. Um, if you go through Dan Rome's uh, pop up pitch pack, there's also really nice aspects of if you don't do this, what are the what are the what are the impact? What is the impact going to be if you don't do this, right? So without using um, scare tactics, I think often we need to paint a picture of this is where we're at now. These are some of the challenges we're facing. If we overcome these challenges by doing X, this is what the world's going to look like. If we don't over overcome these challenges, this is what what the world's going to look like. So in every the only way people are going to make a decision is based on pain or pleasure. All right. And if they don't make a decision, they're still making a decision. They're just delaying. They're just delaying the inevitable. Right. So you need to convince people that with whatever you're positioning, you're going to move them away from pain and move them closer to pleasure. Those are the only reasons why people make decisions. Avoid pain increase pleasure and you need to position clearly benefits and lost opportunities and that's really what this uh, what an effective effective presentation strategy would be once you've done your homework once you've looked at the figures once you've looked at what makes sense to track in terms of that CX barometer for your environment all right, so that takes us to about 40 minutes. I really want to make sure that I open up for questions. So let's get some questions. I'm just going to change my view so that I can see all of you. All right, so you can just unmute yourself, ask some questions, or if you want, you can put some questions in the chat. Let's see. Any questions? I have a question, uh, Chantal, from the chat. Marley would like to know, is there a better way than MPS scores to measure CX and CX efforts? <laughs> Marley, you know, the, you know the answer to that question. <laughs> Marley, is there a better way? Come on, don't ask me questions that you know the answer to. <laughs> 
Come on, Marley. Is there a better way? What have you seen? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the, I only so... do that with Marley because she's my colleague, right? I won't do that with <laughs> so, just so nobody's going to ask a question now <laughs> because they're going like, what the question. hell? <laughs> no, you know what? The the reason I I said that is I think I think we've seen it um, many many times where people, especially the CF CFOs of companies, you know they 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 want like scores and they want like metrics and they want like it must be you know must be quantifiable. And I think uh, your your point to your point in terms of the pain and the gain. What we've seen is if you can let them experience the pain through immersion um, and they feel it and they experience it themselves, then it becomes real because then the, the numbers are there and it's great to have it. But uh, but it's I think it's more effective to let them really feel and, and fill out their own forms. I mean, we've we've made people fill out their, their own forms and, and apply online for their own <laughs> products. Um, and, and then they struggle and they sit for hours on the phone and 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 suddenly those numbers becomes real. And, and I think so. So I think um, I'm always frustrated with CFO. You know, my my view on that, where they always ask for measurements. I think if we can make it um, make it um, something tangible um, and experience, uh, that's 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 what I would say. Oh, well done, Marley. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> and I want to add to that without without insulting anyone that came up with these measurements. But sometimes you need to have the numbers, right? And you need to have your customer satisfaction numbers and you need to have the numbers that I've, I've shown you. But sometimes companies turn into like, I don't know, numbers junkies. They're like, you know, it's like a cocaine fix looking at these numbers, right? And Listen, the first business case I built around CX was questionable, all right? There were a ton of assumptions behind that spreadsheet. And luckily, the assumptions are written like in font size six. So everybody doesn't go through those assumptions. So the numbers looked really beautiful. And, and we did end up achieving some really awesome numbers. But it's a best guess, right? So, you know, I would just guide people and say, don't get fixated on NPS. Get fixated on what that means for the customer. What are they meaning when they're scoring you, um, when they're scoring you like that? You know, what is it? You know, what do you make? What do you make of it? And and if you start moving the needle, what does that? What does that mean? So I think we can get addicted to the numbers. If you start by looking at uh, complaints. So what would some of the tactics I've used in the past, I would just quantify the cost of complaints, right? And I would make some assumptions around what that's doing to your brand, but the real hardcore cost of complaints. I worked with a company and we, we looked at what a complaint, what a single complaint costs them. We took an average of like over the last 12 months and a complaint was like, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars because as soon as a complaint escalates up the chain if you look at the senior people that get involved if a ceo needs to look at a complaint it's thousands of dollars of their time being wasted on something that could have been present prevented if it at first touch if someone dealt with that complaint appropriately and with empathy and with connection and understanding it would have never escalated up the chain so there's a couple of just practical tactics around understanding what does moments of misery cost your brand and um, you know how can you start transforming those all right questions Eunice you've been just, so in you've been so engaged I loved your smile it's just awesome thank having you. you in the room <laughs> thank you this is in the heart of what I do for our organization and we are in the process of you know from speaking about CX to acting right like we truly mean what we say, right? Because you would you would hear uh, leaders in our organization that they would advocate for CX, but really there, there's very little support to CX initiatives. So I'm very interested about that NPS score question. I was going to ask that question too, because you did not list that down as part of your scorecard for CX. And um, our organization manages um, NPS scores. And I've been harping that NPS is not the end all be all. Because if I look at our revenue numbers uh, from previous year, they increase from previous years, there is a, an increase. But if you look at the NPS number, there was a decline. 
So there might not be a direct correlation to our success by looking at our revenue numbers or even driving speed to revenue to NPS. Plus, mind you, most of our strategic customers do not get the NPS survey. They choose not to participate, right? And, and I want to look at some of our revenue driving transactions. They're more system to system, machine to machine transactions. And how do you collect you know, customer insight off of those types of transactions when, it, when it's the machine and another machine, yeah. right, connecting? So yeah. I, I'm very interested, you know, what other, you know, how did you shift an organization's view very heavily dependent on NPS to look at something else, right? Like what you mentioned, customer effort or complaints. Yeah. So, so Eunice, I mean, I mean, this is a this is a tricky question. I had I had dinner with Volvo CEO probably six or seven years ago, and I remember. Mm. So Volvo is like a really I admire the brand, although I might be a little bit too young to fall <laughs> into the target market and just saying. <laughs> my team my team joke with me that I'm too young to drive a Volvo but I just love the I love the brand and I love the sophistication and 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 you know some of the interesting campaigns they've done they really just speak to me and and I I had the fortune of having dinner with the CEO and the CEO, I said to the CEO I was interested in what they measure and how they do you know do how do they do competitive analysis and he said to me like we just don't care we don't care mm-hmm. what our competitors are doing we obsess about our customers and we obsess about every interaction with them being being a positive one. Um, and I, I think it's about the, the I think most customers have this feedback fatigue. I mean, if I get if I get a survey, even if it's just a click of a button, I, I'm just questioning, you know, do we still have the right to interrupt customers? with our questions and what mm-hmm. we want to know right mm-hmm. if they if they want to share their experience with us i reckon we need to give them motivation to share that experience with us and and if i look at some of the so again this is about pain and pleasure that's what you're going to get feedback about is pain mm-hmm. and pleasure and if you just bland and you keep on sending me surveys i'm in menopause my life is short i don't have time for that shit, right so so I really believe and I, I love having these forums with angry customers. And Eunice, I know you're asking me about the upside, but mm-hmm. the thing about angry customers is they have motivation and yeah. they have energy and they're going to tell you a lot of stuff about your brand. And and we facilitate these sessions with angry customers and uh, you know, towards the end of these facilitated conversations, we call them co-design groups because they actually help us co-design a different journey to what they had, right? We Mm -hmm. say, your journey was pretty broken. We want you to come and help us redesign that journey to something that would have led you to a very different end result. And at at some stage, we ask them, okay, you now CEO, you've got two minutes, you CEO of the organization. We can't exactly pay you the CEO salary, but you now the CEO. What is the first thing you would do for your customers with all this knowledge that you have about the brand? And usually our clients who we facilitate this for, they go, no, you can't ask them that. Like they're going to lower the prices. They're going to, you know what, Eunice, in all my engagement with agri customers, they've never wanted to lower the prices, right? Mm-hmm. They go for something like very, like the IVR is too long. I would immediately change the options on the IVR to only be three options. Or mm-hmm. they go, no, take away the IVR and I want to speak to a person or I want to speak to the same person. And we know some of those things are more tricky, but it's unbelievable if you have the right motivation because by the time an angry customer gets to you know these facilitated sessions they've told at least four or five people of the bad experience they've had and they've told them if i was this brand i would have done this this is what they Mm -hmm. should have done they are looking for ways to fix that problem and they've gone they've come up with multiple ways to fix that problem not necessarily all workable, but some of them are pretty darn good. Now, if we have those sessions with 12, with 12 clients and we combine the ideas, we get some amazing, amazing things. So I would say that's the, that's the, um, th- that, that for me is a gold mine in terms of mm-hmm. engaging with angry customers. Now, a lot of brands have made it incredibly difficult to give feedback spontaneously, right? 
on the website, they usually hide the complaint section. They want to make sure that someone maybe loses their way and the effort is so high that they end up not complaining. I advise brands to put as much, open your door so that people don't go to third party sites to complain about you mm. and always frame complaints and compliments together. Like every brand should have on the front page of their website, even the ones that hide their phone number should have some kind of a button there to say, recognize one of our employees. And you're going to learn a lot from that. That for me, if someone takes the time to recognize an employee or say, give us, you know, do you like our app? Give us a compliment about our app. What's the best thing about our app? If you mm -hmm. invite that and you make it easy for people, they will spontaneously tell you. And that for me is a lot more worth than you know, spamming people with surveys to get them to give to give feedback. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I look at the so some of the surveys I get is like you had a conversation with our call center three weeks ago. I go, people, I can't even remember what I had for yeah. breakfast yesterday. <laughs> How do you want me to remember a conversation I had with your call center and tell me whether the person was friendly? Like in 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 this normal uh, there's so much noise and i think when we when we compile those surveys and i put myself in the shoes because i did it for a long time when i was in corporate i i worked in a team like yours and we compiled mm -hmm. those surveys and we were very proud of them right because that was our job that was our mission we had to get into the mind and into the heart of the customer and get them to tell us um but 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 the question sometimes just it, it, just in the context of which they come, my life is way too busy to remember certain things unless there was like a highlight, mm -hmm. unless there was a highlight. If I speak to my bank and they go, Chantal, we see it's your birthday in a week's time and, you know, we don't phone clients, but I just want to say happy birthday. Can I quickly sing a happy birthday to you? And it's someone who can't sing. Jack shit, they cannot <laughs> sing. Okay. That's gonna make an impression on me. So I think understanding, understanding and mapping the places in your journey where you want feedback and the places in your journey where you potentially gonna do something that's gonna elicit spontaneous feedback and then use that spontaneous feedback. So that's just my mm -hmm. loose thoughts around that. Eunice, did I did I give you some ideas? Yes, yes. I think there's there's going to be a shift around collecting feedback, right? It's not, you know, that direct feedback, but it's more of inside. What are the indicators, the way your customer yeah. behaves within your site or how they go through this journey? What are some of yeah. those indicators? That, yeah. yeah. And I want to just quickly say some of those, I mean, if we look at those, um, those transactions that happen, happen system to system, right? Right. Those mm -hmm. are transactions that happen at bulk those are you know b2b relationships mm -hmm. and there is there is something to be said for uh getting feedback at, at a very personal level right so so we run large cx programs for mm -hmm. large corporates um if i have one of the banks that we're working with if i send that C ceo a questionnaire to rate our service, he would be very insulted, right? He's not mm -hmm. going to answer the questionnaire. But if I say to him, can I have 20 minutes of your time so that I can make sure that we are meeting your expectations? I want you to give me open feedback about how, you know, we are solving problems for you. I want you to give feedback on my team, on my mm -hmm. expert facilitators that we have on your project. He's going to feel like I really, really care and None of my none of my CEOs that I work with have ever declined a meeting like that because they know I do it so that I, so that we can be better for them. Mm -hmm. It's not about I demand your time because I want some school. It's about I want to be better for you. I want to show up better for you. I want to improve our service. I want to make sure that, you know, we give you a superior experience into the future. And I think that motivation is is different. Thank so you. design Thank an amazing you. journey where you can get feedback from those from those senior people that are involved in those in those um, contractual relationships there.
Yeah, and I think going back to the conversation of how do you convince your CFO to that, right? Making them feel, making them see, hear directly from the customer. Like this is what we're hearing from the customer. And if you want to be customer centric, right? So somehow they'll you'll be able to invite them to experience what the customer experience. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And Eunice, just the last point on that. So in these co-design sessions we have with clients, in these um, you know, getting like the, really the voice of the of the angry customer. We we collect that we collect that uh, video material. Sometimes we strip the video and we use the audio, and we take that into training with every single person in an organization because it's a lot more powerful. If a client says, "I was so disappointed. I cannot believe I've had such a long relationship with you," and I I, I you do you let me down at my at my most desperate time that goes through your skin because you've been there you've had a fam family member who've experienced that and if you can make someone feel something they can act so mm -hmm. you, you're quite right if you can collect things that you can take back to your executives and say aside from the numbers here's the numbers mm -hmm. but more than that if you care about this brand this is why you want to do it not just the numbers. I'm confident mm -hmm. the numbers will speak for themselves, but this is why we need to do this. All right, that's a great idea. Great idea. It is the first time I, I've, I've heard someone say that because normally people will just go to the sales team who owns that account, right? And give us feedback and speak to it, speak to their experience. But then people will have this notion that, hey, you're a sales guy, right? You're, you care about your commission or what you're gonna get out of this, but what are we really hearing? From the customer love it thank get you get under their skins all mm -hmm. right oh, Eunice thank you you've been such a you've been such thank a pleasure thank you all righty anyone else in the audience with some questions Marilee you want to talk about the peak end rule go for it <laughs> she's never gonna join a webinar again <laughs> no, but she's such a wealth you're such a wealth of knowledge <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about the no, peak end No, rule. I was just thinking, you know, every time that people ask somebody a questionnaire, um, you know, it's uh, it's either, as Chantal was speaking about, it's either I can't remember, so it's bland, okay, or it is like um, I'm, I'm pissed off, I'm totally pissed off, or I'm super excited. Um, and so, so, so the, the peak end rule speaks to that. So people only remember the highs and the lows and how something ends. Um, and, and so where do you leave them in, in, that, in that experience? So, so I think sometimes our, the way that we measure is also not as effective because where do you, where do you, where do you catch the person, where they're at? when they give you the feedback, um, where, um, where you get the score from. Um, so I just wanted to add that because uh, while you were speaking, I was thinking about that, Chantal. And, and often the typical, the typical example we use is in a call center. I phone them because I've got a problem, right? Sometimes they can't solve my problem. And then they end the call with, is there anything else I can do for you? And I go, well, you couldn't do the first thing that I asked you to do. So now you're asking me, is there anything else I can do for you? Because your script tells you to ask me. And then they go, oh, and if you wouldn't mind staying on the line to, to respond to a quick question. <laughs> I go, no, you're going to be kidding me. Like the journey just wasn't designed well keeping that that peak end rule in mind to say all right i need to leave someone on a positive note and that means i'm not i'm not going to do my do my silly script and also i'm probably not going to ask them to fill in a questionnaire unless they phone to say oh, i had such a fabulous experience and i'm taking my time to phone you to tell you about this fabulous experience and they go oh, you know what we want the whole of our c-suite to know about that experience can you please fill in our, our questionnaire so i think it's about it's about being um, appropriate with what you do and it's about always thinking even your your survey experience needs to be plotted on a journey map to say what is the journey i'm taking someone on and why am i asking them to give me to give me feedback all righty we are heading for uh the end of our webinar ruthie you want to land this plane for us amazing amazing it was such a pleasure to chat to you today. I have loved the conversation. 
I hope that some of these uh, practical insights that I shared with you is going to make your life easier. It's going to empower you to shift the conversation, not to defend, but rather to make sure that you hold these things in terms of these are the numbers and this, if you love the brand, this is why you should be, you should be doing this. Um, and I think winning, winning those relationships and getting people to really trust, trust you is, is key in this. Sounds Alrighty. Up. Yes, go for it, Tess. Sorry. So we have a question from Naval on uh, LinkedIn. Our LinkedIn feed seems to be a couple of minutes behind our live feed. Yes. So his question is how to dig out real facts from customer bias and group thinking of customers. Mm, lovely, lovely, challenging question. How to dig out real facts from customer bias. Um, I, I would say there's, you know, obviously when customers get into groups um, and we've, we've seen this, uh, I think more in person than what we've seen it online in online groups, uh, they, they love the drama. So if some, someone mentioned something was really bad, you know, people, people would pitch in. I think if you've got your journeys um, clearly mapped, and if you have a very clear idea on what you would like those journeys to be, it helps you understand what questions to ask. And it also helps you to look at the information that you're getting back in the context of, of, of the journey. So there is, we, we work across industries, we work across brands, we've done a lot of work in financial services. So there is, the science, but there's also a bit of art and magic that you put into this, where you sanity check some of what you some of what you're getting back. Another thing is that I want to mention that's that's really key is you need to articulate what experience you want your clients to have. That that's the most important foundational block that you want to build any any customer focused improvement on, because often we would come into a customer environment and, and, and they would say, but we've done customer journey mapping, have a look at our maps and I get Excel spreadsheets or something that is very um, process oriented. And I go, all right, so before we get to that, tell me what is the experience that you want to create? Tell me about the essence of your experience. How do you want a customer to feel about themselves in an interaction with your brand? And they go, I don't know how to answer that question. How do I want them to feel about themselves? I want them to feel like they spent their money while I go, no, we need to dig a little bit deeper, right? So I think it's about knowing your target experience, asking questions about your current experience in the context of your target experience to really understand what people are seeing and what they're experiencing. And if you have a CX team that have been really well trained and they've got a toolbox of methods, I'm convinced that they'd be able to look at some of the data and blend a bit of the art and the science and the magic to really un to really help you. And I mean, it, it's the, the thing about experience is the experience happens inside the customer and you're never going to get like inside the customer. All right. There's always this internal narrative that they might never tell you. The way we've gotten to that internal narrative is we use a lot of interesting facilitation methods and we let people tell us stories. And I'll, I'll give you just a quick example. So I, I often tell the story about me going to a grocery store. and Usually I turn into like a total angry monster in a grocery store, right? And like if there's no tools open, I, I just become impossible. The real story is I hate grocery stores because I'm not, I'm not really in charge of managing my home. My husband does that. I'm a total failure as a domestic organizer, right? I don't cook. I really know what's in the fridge and I wouldn't know how much toilet paper we have. So when I'm put in a grocery store situation, I get really nervous and I just want to hit and run. Like I just want toilet paper in and out. Like I don't enjoy being in a grocery store. So that is an internal narrative that I will never tell someone if they're asking me in a survey, Eunice, I will never tell someone that I feel terrible as a wife and a mother. 
and that you know it's not my strong point and i really i don't like grocery stores i i, I avoid going in there nobody will ever hear that so I think the experience happens inside of the customer and what they tell you might not be accurate, but you're probably never going to get an accurate view unless you put them in some kind of a brain scanner or give them some illegal truth serum of sorts and let them tell you the whole story. So that's, <laughs> I know that's not a, but I think important, define your essence, have your team well trained so that they can they can use the methods, they can use the toolbox, and that they have all of these building blocks in place. And Ashad, maybe you can tell people just about, Ashad can give you a little bit more insight. We have what I think is an amazing five-day program that will really boost your team's efforts. Um, we have taken everything we've learned in the last 15 years, we've put that into a five-day really, really extensive program to help CX teams deliver more results uh, and to really understand that it's not it's not a customer journey, right? It's a whole ecosystem that you need to consider when you want to make these changes. But Ashad, um, we, we are looking at some dates uh, for late June. But if you're interested, Ashad will drop his details in the chat. And you can mail Ashad and he will tell you everything that you need to know about the training course. And this is but one aspect that we um, we train in that training course. And for us, it's such a pleasure. There's so many broken experiences in the world that we want to teach people how to be able to do what we do and how to deliver results in a short space of time. Because we've made some early rookie mistakes and, and we want to prevent people from doing that. So if you're interested, hit Ashad up in uh, using his email that is just put in the chat. And I just want to say thank you for your time. Thank you for your smiles. It's been an absolute, absolute pleasure to spend this time with you today. And watch out, we're doing like one um, one webinar a week. We're actually going to change that into a mini workshop so that we can give you some of these resources. So follow me on LinkedIn and you'll see when we have the next ones coming up. All right, Ashad, you're going to play us out with the song. <laughs>